what do you look for in a, in a deer spot when you're e-scouting? Oftentimes I'm looking for places where, you know, they have good access to food, good access to water and good places to hide places that other people might overlook because they're not stunningly obvious for some reason. And that's where I usually tend to find the biggest deer. There is an element of like, if it's really difficult to get to, you could see things there that other people just aren't willing to go look for. And so you just never know what you're going to find. I was like, well, if I throw a mic on, then I can help others the way that these people have all helped me. Born in the heart of the Pennsylvania deer camp, with the help of experts, friends, and local legends, we bring you valuable knowledge and powerful stories for your hunting adventures. Welcome to the East Meets West Hunt Podcast with your host, Bo Martani. All right. We're live. Brad Brooks from Argali. Welcome to the podcast, man. I'm, I'm excited to get to get to talk to you here. We, uh, we got to meet and hang out a little bit at the Western Hunt Expo out in Salt Lake. And, and I've been a big fan of your stuff from a, from a content side of things for a while. And then also now as Argali has kind of morphed into a company of making products, it's, uh, it's pretty cool to get to have you on. Oh man, uh, mutual feeling. I've been following you for a while. Um, and yeah, really respect and like the content and the format that you have here. So, um, yeah, I'm really, I'm actually really excited to be on your podcast, man, and get a chance to talk with you. Um, which I, and I know we'll get into it, but also I've been like white tail curious for a long time. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been like secretly absorbing white tail content and, uh, for a while, um, sort of under the table. Well, I think a lot of people, uh, probably wouldn't assume that about me, but so, yeah, anyways, I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's nice to uh, be on and I've, it's been fun to get to know you a little bit. Yeah, no, it, no, it's really funny is it, there's, you know, a bunch of you guys that are from out West that I've, you know, looked up to and learned from on a Western hunting front as I'm trying to learn more over the last, you know, eight years of going out West and, and doing that. And, and the more that I talk to, I get these like side conversations of like, <laughs> hey, you know, like I've been watching your stuff because I really like like whitetail and I really want to, you know, get into it. And um, another guy from from Idaho, actually, I have on next week coming on, uh, Zach Bohe. Um, oh, yeah. Well, uh, Zach, great yeah. dude. Great guy. Yeah. Awesome guy. And he, he, you know, he had messaged me one day out of the blue and said, that, you know, he's like, hey, man, like I'm like, I love the whitetail stuff. Like I'm getting into it. I'm like wait, what? I was like, I was like, you're kind of how I learned how to hunt open country <laughs> elk, know. you know? And like, know. like you're who I would watch to do that and just net, wouldn't have expected it. But it's, it's, it is funny that, you know, when I get, you know, people like you on and, and some others that are, are also interested in the, in the whitetail game. And, you know, to me, it's just like, it's kind of one of those things I feel like that you grow up doing something and you do it so much, you almost kind of take it for granted and you're always looking for that new thing. And for you, that's a new thing. It's totally new. Yeah. Yeah. And we have whitetails here in Idaho. Um, uh, I probably shouldn't say that out loud, but I mean, they're around, right? Just like nobody yeah. really cares about them. They're you just like most people in Idaho don't really care about the whitetails we have out here. Um, and for me, it's always hunting has always been about doing, I, I really enjoy doing like new things, hunting new animals and new places and new challenges and having to just kind of figure it out. Um, that's really fun for me and whitetails because they, they just aren't the thing that I grew up hunting. Um, I really enjoy hunting them now. And my dad is from Wisconsin. So like my whole dad's side of the family is from the Midwest. I grew up hunting elk, like you would hunt whitetails um, we used to do like elk drives, uh, in the mountains when I was like a high school kid. Um, nice. so yeah, like the way I grew up learning how to hunt, it was very much like a Midwesterners approach to hunting elk before there was any content or information about how to do it. It was just like, yeah. you know, my dad just like figuring it out on his own. Um, you know, a guy that grew up hunting whitetails in the Northern Wisconsin woods. So, but yeah, oh, I do nice. think. I also think there is kind of like this, <laughs> there are a lot of us in the West now who have just been like, man, these white, maybe there is some of this whitetail game. We should like try it out, see what it's, and I, I feel like there is this like false division about you're either a West, uh, uh, I mean, given, you know, your name, right? It's like yeah. East, East, the whitetail mule deer, East or West. And I like it all. I yeah. love it all. 
Um, I think it's all interesting. I don't think there's like a good or a bad. It's just different, different styles, different. And, and I enjoy it all. So, um, yeah. No, that, that's, <laughs> that is, it is kind of cool. As now, as all of us from the, the East and the Midwest have, you know, been found, you know, more information on how to go out West, you know, through platforms like this and so many other different places, you're like, all right, you guys are crowding us out here. We're going to go, we're going to go. <laughs> you guys right. are gone Coming not back, over in the East yeah. and the Midwest. So we're going to head there and start. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you've been shooting my deer. I'm going to go shoot your deer. So, <laughs> yeah. How do you like that? No. no, it is true, but it's, it's been really fun. I've, I've, uh, um, just only done a little bit of whitetail hunting, but what I have done, I really enjoy it for different reasons. Right. Um, and if you gave me a choice about what to hunt, you so you only get to do one thing. Like I, I probably wouldn't pick whitetail hunting like today. Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean I don't really enjoy the whole thing and the whole process. Um, and just how different and unique it is. I will say, yeah, I got more buck fever last year on a white whitetail than I have in a long, long time. And I don't well, know why. Yeah. But I watched it to me. I watched the video on your YouTube channel, and okay. I heard you you say that in there, and it, it's that is that was comical to me because it's like <laughs> not comical, but just like it, it it made me laugh because it was just it's like oh man, like the the feeling I got when I you know see my first elk and I drew my bow back on it, it was like that was a whole nother yeah. level of, you know, buck fever and mm -hmm. it, probably just the, the difference of it. And also just like being elevated, looking down also is like a different feeling of it too. Yeah. I, I don't get, um, I just don't often get, I should say, uh, that, that buck fever. I love it. You know, I, I actually, I think there's maybe a little bit of a stigma around, like if you get buck fever, that's a sign that, you aren't experienced or it's like, no, man, I, I get it and I love it. And I think knowing how to control it is one thing. But when I, you know, you have those moments, like for me with elk hunting, they're, they're fun, right? I, I enjoy them, but I usually, I, I, I don't think I, I can't remember the last time I had about a buck fever on a bull elk that was, you know, even five, 10 yards from me it just doesn't happen to me anymore. Um, I still enjoy those moments, but it doesn't yeah. induce that, that level of whatever that is that causes the buck fever, that adrenaline rush. And so when I had it, when I was by tail hunting, I was like, Oh, it makes you feel alive. Right. I love it. Um, so yeah, I don't know what it was elevated. If it was just, it was just like the anticipation of like, you know, I, all, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I really enjoyed it. Well, and I, you know, I kind of have to wonder too of seeing a little bit your background and the rock climbing and, and doing all that other stuff that's very, I mean, to me, it would seem like very adrenaline filled type or just putting yourself mm -hmm. in situations that that would heighten your awareness and do those things that it would be difficult to to get that feeling in, in other things that may not, you know, not necessarily life or death type of, you know, scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Do yeah. you think that has anything to do with kind of like your calmness in that, in that moment? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, rock climbing, there's a lot of, you have a different relationship with fear when you climb a lot. And when, you know, there, there are things that I I won't do any more that I've done rock climbing wise just because I have kids and I'm married and it's just not okay for dad not to come home. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've done things where, uh, I mean, anybody who's like pushing their limits rock climbing can relate to this. Like you do things where it's, it, you're in, you get yourself in situations where falling is not okay because you're like, you're going to break your legs. You're, you're going to die. Like, um, and it sounds, uh, when I say it out loud, it sounds like, oh my gosh, like, why would you even do that? I think when you're, when you know yourself and your body and what you're capable of, it doesn't feel like, oh my God, if I fall, I'm going to die. You're very much just like honed in. You're like, no, no, I know exactly what I'm doing right now. And that fear is like in the back of your head, but you don't let it dominate. You don't let it like increase your heart rate or increase your breathing. You're just, you are in control of the, your fear as opposed to the opposite being true. And then when it comes to, yeah, to hunting, to me, like hunting isn't, uh, there's really not much that's dangerous about hunting. I'd say like hunting in brown bear country, definitely dangerous. Um, there are certain types of hunts that, that have an element of danger to them. But 
for me, like compared to the things <laughs> that I've done in my life, like it seems fairly tame. Um, and also, you know, if you're, I've been climbing for 20 plus years now at this point, it's like, if you're going to continue to do it that long, like you have to either learn to, to manage and deal with fear in a very, very direct visceral way, or you just like, it burns people out. Like eventually as people I, I have learned this is like a lot of my climbing friends have gotten older. They've gotten out of climbing because they don't like having to like have that head on relationship with fear. And so, yes, there is a direct correlation between understanding fear, knowing how to manage it, um, knowing how to manage those really intense moments where you're like, your adrenaline gets going really, uh, in an intense way, like understand it, that it's happening. Don't let it control you. It's very comparable um, to those intense moments in, in hunting for sure. How much do you, do you feel that comes down to the amount of preparation that you put into that? Like, do you, how, like, cause, because saying it of saying like, okay, overcoming fear or overcoming those moments of being able to calm yourself and mm -hmm. say, even you're at full draw on a, on a buck or a bull or whatever, you know, saying that is one thing, but being able to actually do it is, is another thing. And how much, how much do you feel like that comes down to the oh, preparation that you put in a ton, a ton of, yeah, it's, yeah, you're right. Saying it is one thing. And I think most people think like, Oh, you know, I can, I can do that. And most people can, but you have to, you have to make it a regular practice of your, your daily weekly life so that when you get to those moments, it's not the first time, that you've been in that situation or even the second or third time, you're just like, Oh, this is a part of my life. So what I mean by that for me, let me tell you what that looks like. So I do, um, I do mental exercises. Um, so part of this is my, um, just like almost daily practice now of shooting my bow at 3d targets with broadheads, um, primarily. So I think there's a different emotional reaction when you draw back with a broadhead on your bow. I'm not the first person to say practice with broadheads, but I really believe it's imperative. Um, and also drawing back on a, on a 3d target that's shaped like an animal that you're going to shoot is different than shooting in a block or a bag target. Um, and then also just sort of like visualizing in my mind, I'll go through an exercise of like, pretend like this is, you know, like, like getting on my knees, drawing, and then kind of having to like stand up and shoot. Like it's a real world scenario. Like, so playing out those scenarios in my head and making my practice as much as I can, like the real world, um, helps me a ton. Um, because it, like I said, it, if your first time drawing back with a, a broad head or maybe not your first time, but if it's not, if you're drawing back on a bow on a live animal and, it's, it's an infrequent thing in your practice or in your life, it's going to feel much more intense as opposed to routinized. So making that your routine as, as close as you can to the real thing makes a huge difference for me. And then also, um, just like getting my, getting myself, my heart rate up, getting my adrenaline up and then and forcing myself to like shoot in those situations also helps. So I don't know if that's what yeah. you meant when you said, like, no, that's look like, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, from a, from a hunting standpoint, yeah, 100%. Like I, I just, I, I find like, even for myself, that was something that, that I've in very similar, like as far as with shooting, like I used to, you know, I'd always shoot almost every day out in the yard, but it'd be like the same thing every time I'd go out and I'd, you know, shoot 15 arrows or I'd have like a, a goal of the amount of arrows versus the scenario. So now it's like, once I basically, once my bow, I know everything's dialed in, my sight tape's good, everything's going like it's, it's important to, to be able to shoot those known yardages and things. But, you know, now it's different, especially, you know, as we're recording this beginning of July, it's like, okay, I went in and, you know, I'm shooting at least a couple broadheads a day that are in, in mixed with my stuff. I have the 3d targets. I have a two dimensional elk that I put up and I, I put against uh, a block target basically that, because that just helps with the visualization of, yeah. of an elk. Cause that's, I have two elk hunts this year. So it's like, okay, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm focused on. And honestly, I shoot better at 3d targets than I do dots. Sure. I don't know, yeah. you know why, but it's just like, for some reason, those dots stress me out where shooting at a 3d target, I, I, I tend to do better with it. But also I look at like, you know, past scenarios of where I've messed up of like, okay, you know, 
not knowing, okay, I'm, I have, you know, three pins and a slider, but it's like, okay, there, the, the deer's at 36 yards and there's my 30 yard pin and my second one's at 40 or whatever it is. And it's like, okay, where, or I mean, the way mine, mine set up, it's 30 yards and say the second one comes out at 45 cause they're fixed pins, but they're mm-hmm. on a slider. So it depends on the speed of your bow, but it's like, okay, where do if I have my 30 yard pin on this elk, how much is that dropping? You know, does it matter if I'm right on with range? And I've learned that in scenarios, especially with elk hunting, you know, with when I'm, when I'm deer hunting, I pre range, I'm sitting in a tree ranging all the time. So I kind of have ideas versus elk hunting. What I've learned and where I've messed up many times is you're running and you're gunning and all of a sudden you get into an opportunity and you're set up and all of a sudden the, the opportunity happens and you may ne- not get a chance to range. And like, a lo- there's so many different scenarios in there. And so I'm trying to practice for those situations and visualizing those happening. Um, but I, you know, that I, I totally agree with what you had said there. And even, and I went to, a, I had mentioned it on a recent podcast too, but I went to a long range, uh, shooting course with some, some former, uh, Navy SEALs, uh, last year. And, you know, just listening to them talk, it was just like, there was no special, you know, they had no special, I mean, they have special skills, but really it just came down to practicing the right things over and over and over and over again, that it doesn't even become a, you know, a thought in their mind or they, you know, you maybe have a mental thing that you go through when you go to shoot in that moment of truth. But that's, to, to me, it's definitely a, a, a weakness of mine that I've been been working on over the last few years is that that portion of it. Yeah, and I, I think for, you know, for Western hunting, I shoot a five pin for my bow, like a five pin slider because things change fast, right? Like animal might be at 20 yards now, it's at 60 and you, you don't have time to like range oftentimes, like range it, move your sight. You know, it's all just like, because, you know, the, the red zone uh, on at least again, like most of my experience is Western hunting, whether that's like caribou, moose, deer, elk, um, or even coos, like it ha- stuff happens fast. So my entire setup is, is designed. My, my entire approach to hunting is designed around simplicity and the ability to, to, uh, be dynamic with the situation, whatever that looks like. And so, yes, I can dial my site beyond 60, but rarely do I in a hunting situation because usually you're shooting you try and shoot closer distances um, yeah. if you can. Right. Um, but yeah, when I practice, like I don't, I don't just go to like 50, 60, 30, 40, whatever those even distances and, uh, and shoot because like at some point it's like, you can't hit, I mean, you're going to, you're going to become proficient enough to, to, to have tight groups at those even yardages. But what about, you know, if you, if you're going to gap shoot, which is what I do, you really have to practice that gap shooting. That's the pr- rarely are you going to get those even distances. And I was just, um, talking with someone recently where I'm like, I have never shot an animal at an even yard distance. Um, for whatever reason, it's never happened to me, but I practice at the off yardages, uh, all the time, every day. That's what I do. Um, and then I do long range practice just as like to have like, just focus on my form and everything. But yeah, the more realistic your, your practices, the better that sounds super simple. Um, and not complicated, but I don't know many people who actually do it as, yeah. you know, on a consistent basis. I think, you know, most people that Western hunters that I know, if they gap shoot, they practice a little bit on their gaps and then they go, they go to their, you know, whatever public range there is or whatever their house. And they just shoot it like an even distance. And like, I'm going to shoot five arrows at 30 yards or 40 yards. And then I'm going to call it good. Um, that isn't hunting specific, you know, like shoot kneeling shoot sitting. Like I, I shot, uh, last year, like one deer sitting out of a tree stand. Another time I was like sitting with like my legs in a weird position in Canada. Like, you know, like all those funky positions matter and you shoot differently. And so anyways, I, yeah, I I think that preparation matters uh, for hunting for me. And then, um, uh, yeah, also just, I think, and this is back to your question earlier, just about how do you deal with like stressful situations? Like, put yourself in stressful situations and make yourself deal with it. That's, that's what I do. And that helps me <laughs> kind of like, so when I do get in those situations, like, okay, I've been here before. I know how to deal with this. Yeah, no. And, and, and I think a lot, I mean, and definitely some of that comes with, with time and experience too of, of, you know, either messing up or coming yeah. to that. It's just like always trying to find the ways to minimize that learning curve of, 
cer- certain scenarios and and I, and I agree with like the the stressful situation side of it like you know for the most part even like when it comes to like fitness and, and training most of the stuff that 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 I do through the program that, that I do it with is, is very just is routine and building up the, the capacity to be able to do the work. But then every once in a while doing those tests of like, okay, can I do this, you know, past <laughs> yeah. where I think I can and where, and what, you know, and even for example, like this, this coming weekend, I'm going for it, a, a two night backpacking trip. We're just going to go do some fishing. It's just like, okay, get all my gear out, get out, you know, setting up the tents. What do I have? Oh, did I forget this broke last year? What happened? Just kind of getting yeah. yourself familiar with those situations and, and practice it versus, you know, the first time that I'm needing to do that is in September. And it's a you know tag that I've been waiting for for a long time. Like that's not typically when you want to learn some of those weaknesses. No. Where are you, oh, where are you going elk hunting? Uh, Utah and Montana. Oh, awesome. Nice. Yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm super super excited about about that. It's just one of those things. It's it's a, that where I've been I've been hunting, you know, either over the counter or like general type stuff all all up until this point. But I've been putting in for points, and now I'm starting to get some some better tags. And and mm-hmm. this year is just like a really good good year for for being able to do that. So I'm I'm super excited about it. That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'll be curious to see how that goes for you too. Um, yeah. yeah. Elk hunting, I think is like the, for, it seems like for most of the people that I know that love hunting in like Midwest or East, like that's the pinnacle of things that they want to hunt. Um, which is, I totally, it's totally understandable, right? Like they're, they're this prehistoric looking animal, like they're fun to hunt. Like, yeah, hunting them in the rut is about as fun as you can have much fun as you can have hunting. Um, so Yeah. I'll have to. I think, I think though, after this year, I'm going to switch to, um, focusing more on mule deer. Now we're and talking, re- bro. Now we're yeah, talking. Okay, see, yeah. Let's because go. Because like, <laughs> you know, I love deer species and I, and it was more of like, once I started elk hunting, it was just like, I needed to do this thing until, you know, I was s- somewhat successful at it. You know, and I'd, I'd shot a bull. It took four years to shoot a bull and, and then, now it's just getting some better tags and doing that. But I hunted mule deer last year and j- got to go on stocks and do that. And it was just like, oh my gosh, is this so much fun? To, <laughs> it's to so be much able fun. To, like I, I, I've learned like as I've gone out west and and starting to learn. Like I like seeing things and sitting behind the glass and mm-hmm. watching things unfold in the whitetail woods in the Appalachian Mountains. It's thick. You don't really see something until it's in shooting distance. It's right there. You really don't know what's going on around you for the most part. So it's like super nice to to see country and have the ability to make something happen. And I that's think that's the, that's really cool. Yeah. I feel like that's the, for me, the hard, hardest part of, of, uh, hunting like denser wooded areas, even for whitetails. I, I should say that the two times I've hunted whitetails outside of the West has been in Oklahoma and it's pretty open where we hunt. So you can, you can actually see a fair amount. Um, and uh, the, to be fair, the first deer I shot there, which was two years ago was a spot and stock deer, <laughs> <laughs> so, which was a really fun way to hunt whitetails as you, I, I know, you know, um, yeah. but yeah, I think just seeing lots of country. I mean, I can sit behind a pair of binoculars on a, on a mountaintop all day long, all day long. It's just so much fun. Cause you never know what you're going to see and just pick a, pick apart country. Just keep, keep picking apart the same part, you know, same country there's something really relaxing about it for me. And it's really, really enjoyable. I don't love like the real dense, the dense hunting and like, you know, where you can't see, you don't know what's going on as much. It's an acquired taste for me. The only time I've done it where I hunted a moose in Alaska um, a few years back in a swamp. And I spent, I think six days without seeing a live animal and it was driving me up a wall. Um, I was just like going nuts. It was really hard mentally to stay in the game. Um, I even took a tree saddle. The first time I ever used a tree saddle, I took it moose hunting and like, I didn't even know how to really use it. Um, but I took one up a tree, like I'll weigh the hell up this one tree to see if I could see something. <laughs> Never saw anything, um, <laughs> that's, that's really but funny. I tried. Yeah. So yeah, I totally get it. And 
that is one of the things I love about, I mean, mule deer, just like a big whitetail, like big deer, just really hard to find, right? They're really reclusive animals. And there's a lot of similarities, I think, between big whitetails and big mule deer. But big mule deer, like the biggest difference, right, is they're just solitary creatures, whereas big whitetails can live in tight spaces, like around urban development. And big mule deer, by and large, like they just can't exist in that kind of environment. They they need their solitude. They need their peace and quiet. Um, and so it feels like when you find one, it's just like, oh my gosh, can't believe I found this. You know, it's really hard, it's but rewarding. Yeah. Is that, I mean, and I know you'd mentioned earlier about you like to go to new country and, you know, learn. Is it, did I hear you correctly when you said yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So like, how does that, I mean, how does that come into play when you're hunting something like, a, you know, a big mule deer that's just, you know, solitary, it's a solitary animal that's just like wants to be alone and out there and, and getting into that country can feel, I'm, I'm assuming overwhelming as far as like, okay, how am I trying to find this needle in a literal haystack or mountain to, to be able to, to do like when you're going into like new spots like that, what, what kind of mindset or what are you doing to, to try to, to increase those odds? Oh man, probably nothing different than you would do based on, you know, I'm, I'm first starting with e-scouting and then, um, just looking at places that just catch my eye for whatever reason, whether that's topography, vegetation, food, like just all the things that I'm like, that just looks like a good deer spot. And I've, I've kind of, no, that's funny. I have, uh, I had a friend who was asked me, he's like, what do you, he's like, what do you look for in, in a deer spot when you're e-scouting? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's just like the, I know when I see it, you know, it's like, it's like, that's just like the right mix of everything, right? It needs to have, you know, be far enough away from any like trail or road. Maybe it's an overlooked spot. Maybe it doesn't have to be necessarily like really far away. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I'm thinking like early season deer, right? And there's a difference yeah. between for me, early season mule deer and late season mule deer and mid season mule deer, totally different approaches for all three of those types of hunting. Um, and then I'll just, yeah. So like you, you pick those zones out. Oftentimes I'm looking for places where, you know, they have good access to food, good access to water and good places to hide. Um, and, and also places that other people might overlook because they're not stunningly obvious for some reason. Um, and that's where I usually tend to find the biggest deer. Um, and then there is an element of like, if it's really difficult to get to, there are more likely to be, you could see things there that other people just aren't willing to go look for. And so you just never know what you're going to find. But, um, I, I would bet like 60 to 70% of the places that I think might have big deer don't have big deer. I mean, it's a really small percentage of places. I spent a lot of time looking and not finding what I want and you just have to be willing to move on. Right. And, and, uh, just know that, you're, you're more than likely not going to see what you're looking for. So you just got to have like lots of options in your pocket if you're trying to look for something big and mature. And then with like, so that's early season deer. And I'd say with late season deer, I'm looking for something totally different. Um, uh, cause you're, you're largely hunting them either on their way to their, uh, winter ground and out West, right? Like deer can move big distances, not always, but they can, right? So what do they want to be? where the doe is going to be. Cause, cause you get these things called like, we call them like rutting pockets for mule deer where they'll just be for whatever reason. They, I think they come back to these drainages or these places where you'll get a, you'll get a congregation of does. And I've, I've sat and watched big deer. They'll come check like a, and I'm talking, you could have like, you know, a three mile stretch of Canyon that is a rutting pocket, but there's lots of does in there and these big bucks might, you know, one day you might see him four miles down at the bottom of this canyon. You don't see that deer for five, six days. And then all of a sudden he'll pop up again. And he's like, you know, a mile or two away in the same drainage. He's just been working that drainage probably the whole time. You just couldn't see him, you know, and he's just checking does and walking, just like wandering around, finding a doe, breeding a doe, and then moving on. Um, but out West, you know, where there's lots of space, some of those, those big deer, like they can roam big distances. It's not a tight area. And so you have mm -hmm. to just be really like patient um, if you know they're around, you know, to, talking about that, the, the rutting side of it, I mean, that's so similar to, 
to whitetails and and like especially in the in the the big woods areas that I hunt where it's like okay there's no agriculture it's just timber and everything so I find these I use historical data of like where has there been rutting activity you know I I use a lot of times trail cameras because you're not seeing these things in person unless you're you know seeing it from a tree but mm-hmm. it'll be like okay you know buck started showing up around these dates because this doe group, maybe one came into heat or whatever's going on. And typically year after year, that stays very similar for specific areas. So it's, it's, as you start hunting areas, you know, longer than you start gaining some more of that, that Intel yeah. and that historical of like, okay, yeah, you might be there in September, October, and there's absolutely nothing. And then, you know, just, just some does hanging around and all of a sudden, you know, November of whatever date that they come through and just be in there. So it's, it's pretty cool to see some of those similarities. And the way that it w- was explained to me at one point was actually from my cousin who's from Pennsylvania and has just been bitten by the mule deer bug and has done really well with it in the early season over the last three years. He was saying, he's like, it's basically, he goes, I feel like it's like I'm looking at the whitetail woods, but being able to see it by taking some of the trees out and looking mm. at it and even yeah, watching yeah, how yeah. they, yeah. it's taught us a lot about even like bedding with whitetails is they're not laying in this one bed all day long. They might move or shift three, four five times. And, you know, you can see that visually with mule deer a lot of times, whether it's the, the, the sun positioning or whatever mm-hmm. it's, it's causing them to, to move around. And that was, that was super interesting. Oh, that is interesting. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I mean, those late, uh, I've, I've seen, you know, or like early season mule deer have diff- little di- different habit habits in different places, but for the most part, it's pretty similar in terms of like, you know, like they're going to find a bed or they're going to find a couple beds that they might move between and they're going to hang out there most of the day, most of the afternoon. Um, not always, but for the most part, that's fairly true. Um, well- yeah. You brought up a you brought up a point too earlier about the you know finding those kind of like those overlooked spots. Is there like a a certain amount of country or a canyon or a spot that that needs to be a certain size to be able to hold a deer? Say the feeding areas, because that's something when when I'd e scout looking at deer specifically when I look at looking at mule deer is like okay is this enough of, you know, feed yeah. to hold a yeah. buck of like, okay, there's some avalanche shoots that comes, come through here, whatever it might be. Is there, is there any criteria for that? Or is that just something you kind of see? And in- I, I don't think there's a yeah, hard set criteria. I think the, the, the most important thing about mule deer is they, especially big deer is they want to feel secure. They want to feel like they're, they're secure wherever it is they're at. And so that, that wherever they're living between like feed and bedding area and water, they want to feel like that zone is they're not being bothered in that area. So to me, that's what's most important. And it can be like an avalanche shoot or it can, you know, I, I doubt, I shouldn't say doubt, but I have never seen a mule deer who just lives in like an avalanche shoot. I've seen deer who like will hang out a lot in avalanche shoot, but maybe pops over the ridge and hangs out on the other side of it, comes back. Um, and, you know, they're not, I think there is a, an assumption about mule deer that they're these incredibly habitual creatures. They do the exact same thing every day. And that is, in my experience, has not been true. You will find patterns that sometimes are the same and sometimes you're not. Like I hunted, uh, uh, uh that we were talking about briefly that uh, film run out that we did. I hunted, uh, uh, a deer that was doing, I watched him a lot in August and he was doing a relatively had a relatively similar behavior pattern, but then come uh, hunting season, I didn't see him for five days in the places he'd been hanging out. And I knew he was around, but it took me five days of just sitting there watching the same, same spots before he just popped up. And Oh, there he is. Like, I don't know where he's been. He's probably been close. I just haven't seen him, you know? So, um, so yeah, I don't, I I think anyways, I, I hear people talk sometimes about mule deer is like, Oh, if you just like, find out what they're doing one day, they'll do the exact same thing the next day. It's like, that's maybe that's true for that particular deer in that particular spot in that situation. But it's a broad generalization to make about mule deer that they will all do that because that has not been my experience that it's, it's just situation specific. It depends on like how comfortable is that deer in that basin 
or in that place, does that deer feel like it has like one or two bedding areas or does it have a whole bunch of options that it can pick mm-hmm. from? Right. And maybe today it decides to get water over here because there's lots of water and tomorrow it's going to get water over there or there's only one water source. Yeah. Probably will go to the same water source. So it just depends on the situation. And you back to your question, like, I don't think there is a general rule, but um, I don't think it has to be incredibly large. I think it just has to be big enough to make that deer feel secure and feel like it has everything it needs, like bed, feed, water, um, and just give it that sense of security. Yeah. And, and something else you just said there that, that sparked something in my mind, you talked about, you were looking at, you know, it took you five days to see that deer pop up. Is that, is that something typical? If you find an, an area that you think is good, that you'll sit there that long in one, one particular location, or did I, did I hear no, you wrong? No, no, normally I won't. I don't have that kind of okay. patience, man. Uh, <laughs> but I had, the only reason I, I did is because I knew that deer, I had watched that deer three other times in, in the month prior. And mm-hmm. I knew he was around and I knew that unless somebody bumped him, there was no reason for him to leave. So I knew he was going to, I shouldn't say I knew I, I would have had, I would have found it hard to believe that he would not be in that same area unless somebody bumped him out of there. And I knew that it was the, the beginning of the, um, season. So I knew nobody else had been in there. Anyways, I just knew I'm like, he's got to be around here. But after four days, yeah. Was it hard to keep the faith alive? Like, yes, I was questioning my judgment. (laughs) Um, but yeah, he showed up, he showed up. I don't know where he'd been hang. I don't know. Maybe he went to the mall. Maybe he was kicking it somewhere else. I don't know, but yeah, he wasn't around. We, we tend to have these like these thoughts in our heads of like what these deer are doing or the, the reason they're yeah. making certain choices. And you got the more, I, the more I see deer do deer things, it's just like a lot of times I feel like it's just kind of whatever they feel is, you know, they're kind of yeah. like humans on like, <laughs> Oh yeah. You know, I feel like, you know, I'm, I just kind of want to get some McDonald's today. I'm I'm going to yeah, go, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go, you know, somewhere else. And my buddy used that analogy for, for deer. A lot, we were in one spot that was just like, nothing just seemed to funnel them in any way. He's like, I just think these deer just kind of wander. And sometimes and just, you know, they have places they feel safe and, but you know, it's like kind of let their nose just kind of dictate where they're going and they're hungry, get some food, they're, you know, they're thirsty, gets, get some water and it's kind of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard not to anthropomorphize too much, right, about why they're doing certain things. I don't get too wrapped up in that. I just kind of figure the animal's doing what it's going to do for whatever reason. It's not really my concern why. I just can control what I do after the fact. But yeah, um, because you could spend like an inordinate amount of time trying to dissect why an animal does a certain thing. And and I think you're just better off saying like, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Like they're just a wild animal making decisions based on whatever is going on in their brain, but it ultimately it doesn't matter, right? You're just like, well, all I can do is observe and, and try and do what I, you know, do what's in my control. But yeah, normally I'd say like, just back, you, you made me think of something there. Like normally if I was like, I, if I'm going into a, a spot deer hunting where I have not had a chance to scout it and, and to be honest anymore, like I have two kids I've got a busy life. Like I don't, I don't get out as much as I used to. Last year was an anomaly for me in terms of being able to get out a lot scout. Um, I, I don't, I would not sit in a basin for five days. If I didn't know it was already there, I would check it out and I would keep moving. I, I could come back to it and check it out, but I would probably just like keep bumping along and trying to find something else because if I don't see it, you know, within a day or two, I'm like, well, I'm just, I'd rather take my chances moving on, but it makes you wonder Wait. how much you miss. You, you own, so you own a hunting company, but you don't have just, un, and you know, is endless amount of time to go out and scout. <laughs> Wait, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's kind of intuitive, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. It, it, it's, uh, I, it's I hunt a lot. I, I'm very, very yeah. fortunate, but also when I'm outside of hunting season, I really try hard to, uh, be a good dad and, and, you know, do all the family stuff because I'm gone enough for, a uh, good chunk of the year. Yeah. So it's really just like a priority situation. And I, yeah. And I get to do enough of it that I'm like, do I really need to be gone three extra weekends in August? 
you know, when I could be doing other stuff with my family. So it's just life balance, right? It's hard to, hard to find time to do everything. Well, yeah. And I know, I mean, I saw it where, uh, you know, you saw it in the film run out that we were just talking about where, you know, you have also this love for rock climbing and, you know, both of those things take, you know, a lot of time and dedication and you have a a family and, and all the, in business and all these different things and trying to be able to balance all of that. That's not, I mean, there's not any more time in the day. So it's, it's, it's a, that, that, that I can imagine that'd be a very difficult balance of being able to do those things. Well, I think it's every, you know, yeah, it's, it's, but my situation isn't more difficult than like anybody else's, right? It's like a priority yeah. setting. Like what's important to you, right? Like, what do you want to do? And, and I could probably just like give up on the hunting company thing and maybe get like a job. I don't know. Maybe that would give me more time, but like, I love what I do. So that's really not an option, but I think we all have to make trade-offs and prioritize our time in certain ways. Um, and yeah, like climbing and hunting are two things that require an immense amount of time to do them, I think, well, and do them the way I want to do them. And it's, yes, it's a, it's a balancing act, but I, I feel like everybody kind of makes that, does that juggling act in their own way, whether or not you have kids, you're married, you're not married, you don't have kids. It doesn't really matter. Like we all have things that fill up our lives and everybody's busy. I don't know a single person who isn't busy. Do you know anybody who's not busy, Bo? No. I say everybody's no, I busy. <laughs> no, I do. I do not. And yeah. I think I had I had this I had this weird like thought in my head that once I left corporate America and I was working for myself, that all of a sudden I'd you know I'd have this free time, and it was actually the complete opposite of that. Where it's like you know you, you know it exactly. It's like okay, you, your own company is like if you're not doing stuff with it sometimes, at least for me, I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm falling behind or I need to be doing this or yeah. because you, your paycheck isn't you know necessarily coming in automatically every couple of weeks, you know, it's kind of up to you to be able to do that. So that adds another element to it. And to, to you know, but at the same time where we have that, that advantage is the freedom of, you know, being able to go out and, the whole month of September, if we want to set everything up that we can go out and go hunting or whatever it might be. So there's like, again, trade-offs with everything. Yeah. I think the, if, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, it's when you, especially when you're running your own show, there's a, a, a level of output that is correlated with the level of input that you put in. The more you, you can't, like, I, I don't work is never off for me. It's, 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 I'm sure anybody who owns their own business can understand this. It's like, it just sort of happens all the time. You're always kind of on. I never stop thinking about it. Uh, mostly by, that's by choice because I, I love it. Um, but yeah, you can also, you're also the, the pot, the plus side is that you're, you're in control of your future and your time in some ways. Um, but you can't just be gone messing around all the time. You have to actually like, uh, get things done and make sure things get done. Um, I actually think the, the perfect scenario for somebody who wants to just hunt all the time is not getting a job in like the hunting industry. It's finding a job that gives you the maximum flexibility and leaning into that really hard outside of the hunting industry. That's the, I think that's the secret that not a lot of people understand. understands. like there are really flexible jobs out there. Uh, and you just need to find those that allow you to like work remotely, um, you know, get a, get, get a Starlink set up, you know, put it in your truck. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's lots of ways you can, you can milk a situation to give yourself maximum time in the field. It isn't hunt working in the hunting industry. <laughs> so. No. And it, it is, it is so funny. I, I just talked about that recently too. And someone was asking okay. me about the, and it's like, I'm like, hey, I am not discouraging anybody from, I love, I love this industry. I love, yeah, absolutely. you know, being able to, you know, work on products with, with, with the other company with Timber Ninja and, and with just even with companies that I help out with on like giving feedback and working through things. And I love going out and, and trying to share stuff that helps people. Like, I love all of that stuff, but that, that definitely is doing all that stuff. Like, and I've said it before, so I don't want to harp on it too much, but it's just like me going out hunting. Isn't what I'm getting paid for. It's sitting in front of this computer 
doing the things yes. like, you know, totally. what we're doing right now or, or whatever <laughs> yeah. else it is to, to be able to do so. But like with you and, and Argali is, is super interesting to me because it just seemed like one day, you know, I'd, I'd, had watched your YouTube channel for for quite a while and loved the films and loved the, the the adventure hunts that you go on and stuff. But then all of a sudden you started making products. Like how did that come along? Oh, uh, really simply, I think I, I am very anal and meticulous about my gear, and so I just I have a lot of as anybody around uh, here knows. Like I have a very strong opinions on gear and equipment. And I was frustrated. It all started, I think I was really frustrated with the game bags that I was using at the time and just wondered why it felt like the people that were making game bags at the time weren't making game bags that were designed to last. Couldn't hang them by the paracord, just like a bunch of little things. And I was just like, you know what? The hell with it. I'm going to make, I'm going to make my own game bags because I can do better than this. And uh, so I did that and we, at the same time we were, we were also getting, this is probably like 2016, 2017, we were getting a fair number of questions from people. It was not something I anticipated happening who were interested in doing the style of hunting we were doing, but we just had like very basic gear questions about like, why do you use that pack? Why do you use that pair of boots or whatever? Right. So I don't know why I didn't anticipate that that would happen, but I just didn't occur to me that everybody didn't know why. Uh, why certain products work better than others or why. So we were getting these gear questions. I decided to make a set of game bags. And at the time there really weren't technical game bags on the market. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but because now it feels like everybody makes a set of game bags, but we, those game bags, like our first run of them sold out like really fast. And I, I really didn't expect that they would. I didn't have really a marketing channel, um, set up to really, to really market other than our films. And I did a, I remember a handful of podcasts at the time. And so that sort of spurred like, you know, making our game bags. And then from there, I was like, well, you know what? I've got other ideas of things I've always wanted to make. And so then we started making knives and those did really well for us. And then after that, it was like off the races, um, that led to tents and trekking poles and everything we make now. And so, yeah, it's been an iterative process. And usually my uh, no, not usually a hundred percent of <laughs> what we decide to make is based on something that where I feel like I have a unique enough idea to make something that is unique in the marketplace, whatever that is. And it's, it's really just a gut reaction of like, am I excited about it? Because I feel like it's solving a problem that I have encountered or that I know exists in the world. If I'm not excited about it, like we just don't make it right. If I don't think it's actually doing anything, like we're not, I don't do copycat products that I think are just like some, you know, a different color of something that already exists. Like I have no interest in that whatsoever. Um, and I think my, my bias is, is, is towards making things that are incredibly, uh, uh, made, made to last and made to perform at a very high level. So like high functioning gear. I don't have any tolerance for things that work most of the time. I want my shit to work all the time. And I want them to be like really well thought through. Like every time, you know, now a customer buys a piece of gear, I I take it very much as like, there's this trust relationship between me and them about like, I made this thing and you need to trust me that it's going to work. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, that's kind of how it got started. And it just sort of snowballed from there. So it's been an iterative kind of snowballing process on the gear front. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome, and I and I noticed that even with like looking at the product line and seeing the booth at at Western Hunt Expo, it's like there's there's not the the shortcuts. Now I haven't used the tents or anything to be able to give you know my thought process there, but just even seeing the way that everything was built was just with a purpose and with with an intent coming from a hunter that had problems and wanted to solve them and i think that's where like some of the best companies you know come from of like actually having problems they want to solve versus just crunching numbers and being right. like oh there's a <laughs> hole in the market here or oh we can do this and pump hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing dollars behind this and beat this person out just because we have you know more money to throw at it and it's just I, and I, I've, you know, even before, 
you know, luckily now that I, I have the ability to be able to get, you know, a lot of this gear, at a, you know, a discounted price or free, like don't get me wrong. But even before that, like I, I've, I found a value in good gear that just worked and I didn't have to fuss with it. And, yeah. you know, I would rather save money and you know, slowly buy the right pieces versus, you know, just getting a bunch of stuff that worked half the time. And that's come into, you know, as of um, a year and a half ago, I don't remember if we had talked about it, that, that I became involved as a business partner and Timber Ninja makes mobile hunting oh, equipment no, for, for, yeah. white, for white, white tail hunters. Cool. So, nice. you know, saddles and sticks and, and, and platforms and that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, I saw the, you know, I see the problems and the needs that, that are there and the the founders that 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 started the company before I got involved there's I mean they're the same way it was just like they like wanted ultralight stuff they're hiking into the the mountains in western North Carolina and these places that were steep and deep and wanted things that were quiet and it's just like you find these needs and and I'm drawn to those types of people that that do it and actually just just so happened um Jason who's a um one of the founders of of Timber Ninja he's a a huge rock climber too and and oh. uh and and he I don't think he does it anymore but he was uh for for a long time and traveled all over and did it and and he brought you know some of that that knowledge and his also he was big into mountain biking and some of that technology that it brought into the hunting space so it was just like sometimes even doing those cross you know different extreme sports if you want to say can help bring some of that stuff into it oh yeah i feel like saddle hunting when i first saw the gear for saddle hunting i'm like oh this is just like climbing equipment like i own yeah. basically all of this except for like the the saddle itself is like a glorified harness right with like yeah that's all it is a climbing harness for the most part yeah it's a, you know made a little differently but yeah no i totally see crossover and that, i think that's one of the cool things happening in the hunting industry right now is there there are a lot of there's a lot of space for niche niche brands which i would consider us one of those but you know the people doing the coolest stuff the most innovative products the best products are not the big brands right now they just aren't and i think it's because they're, they're not adaptable they're not able to do you know they have corporate overlords who are looking at uh, margin a little bit more closely they're looking at you know, market share and be like, well, is this, how does this fit in with our bigger plans? You know? So there's a lot of innovation happening for smaller companies right now. And I've even had conversations with folks that I know in the, the outdoor industry, some, some very large brands, in the outdoor industry. And I've told them like, you know, the, the people and the companies doing the coolest stuff right now are not you guys. Like you guys are just like too stale and too, too like tied up and, and too afraid to take risk. So there's a lot of cool product happening right now i don't I, i'll be curious maybe like 10 15 20 years from now to look back on this period of time to see if it was unique or if this is just sort of you know the way it's going to be and i think because of youtube because of instagram um there has been a bit of a uh, uh um it, you don't have to have uh a, you have to have a big company in order to be able to get the word out about your product and about your mm -hmm. companies so that's one of the you know benefits i would say of of social media even though there's certainly many pitfalls, <laughs> but it's really cool to see uh, what's happening right now across the hunting industry. And it's, it's also, I mean, it's not, as you know, I did not know you were involved with uh, Timber Ninja, um, but uh, there's a lot of cool companies out there that are able to make things based on experience and then take those products to market. And I think people in general are responding really well to those right now. Like people want quality gear customer. I want quality yeah. gear. And the access to information that we all have is so, there's so much out there. There's a lot of like, just frankly, not great or subpar product out there across the board. Um, uh, and I think people are smart. Like we all kind of figure it out. You know, there's forums, there's, there's, you know, honest gear reviews. Not all of them are, not all of them are necessarily like uh, honest, but there's enough yeah. information out there that you, people can really sort through and figure out what, uh, uh, what's going to work for them and what's good and what's not good. So, um, and yeah. I mean, even looking at it too, like, I, I think one of the coolest things that social media has allowed small companies, you know, say like, like you to be able to do is people can become attached or be able to see the people behind it. You know, they can yeah. watch you in your films and on social media and stuff and feel like they know you, even if they don't from a state, like they're like, oh, I'd rather give him my money than, 
you know, this some comp faceless company that that is you know mass producing something, and I think that's a there's there's a really strong uh, part of that, and I, I think that's that's super cool to be able to see. And even if say, for example, I don't know if you guys struggle with this, but I know we struggle with it a lot. Is you know if we go out of stock in something or being able to get something, you know, cause we're a small player and whoever's, you know, making yeah. this stuff. So you get pushed back sometimes and lead times are longer and you run into these situations, but I feel like, it, you know, and, and now even for me seeing that if I see a company, I really want to support, I'm willing to wait a little bit longer for something to come back into stock or, or, you know, deal with a little bit of some of those, some of those yeah. things that happen with small companies to be able to get it versus the convenience of, you know, clicking buy now on Amazon and it being there in two days, you know, that's, there's, I, I, and I think there's, there's definitely a shift in, in a lot more people thinking that way. Oh man. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, we, we are out of stock on, on a lot of things all the time, especially our tents. I can't, uh, our two person tent, I don't think I can make enough of them right now. And which is a problem but for yeah. for our customers, but also like a lot of people are willing to wait. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, but I, I, as a consumer, I connect, and I think this is true for all of us, like people connect to brands, they connect to the culture of the brand, they connect to the people of the brand, um, like you, right? Like they connect to you, Bo, they connect, maybe they connect with me or the culture of the brand, what we represent. And, and so it's as much, anymore about not just about the product you make, but about what your brand represents, who are the people behind the brand, which I think is cool because we're, I'm willing to, you know, we're an open book. I don't mind telling you about us or who we are. No secrets here. Um, I don't know how the bigger brands do it. I don't know what they're doing to try and personalize their brand, but I think, I feel like it creates a, a competitive advantage for smaller companies to do. Like I, I can think of, you know, the arrows I shoot, a lot of the equipment I shoot, the the rifle I shoot, like all those things, like the reason I use that equipment is yes, I like the gear, but I really like the people and the companies behind the gear. And I choose to spend my money. Like some of it I get for free, but I pay for a lot of my, uh, that might surprise people, but I actually do go and pay for gear that I want yeah. from people I like to support their business. Um, Cause I think it's important. Yeah, no, I, 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 I 100% agree with that. And, and, and I think I'd, like you said, I think that is true for most people of being able to see that. And it's just, you know, tired of, of not knowing where your money goes or yeah. being able to, to like, I, that, that's just, for me, I've definitely seen that personally. And even just like, I was buying targets here recently and I, I had asked on Instagram, like, Hey, does anybody know of a 3d target that actually holds together longer than three months? And, you know, and, and someone was like, you know, I had a whole bunch of different companies that had come up, but one was a Pennsylvania company. And, you know, I looked into them and their backstory and they were, you know, sick of finding targets that would fall apart and they figured they could do it at, you know, a little bit of a better price and a little bit longer wait to be able to get the targets. But I was like, yeah, like I'm going to support them. So I bought two targets from them. You know, it's just like trying to find, trying to find those, those, like to me, I love that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a fun time to, yeah, for, for us, especially it's been nice for us being a filmmaking company, prior we have we know how to at least create that content um and tell our story and and let people sort of behind the curtain about like who we are and what we're about and it's worked out i think well for us and uh we're gonna keep doing it because i again like i just feel like that's the future right like that's the future is people want to know who they're spending money with they want to know like who are you know you know speaking for myself like who are you guys make tents like why should I trust that you know what you're talking about? It's like, well, I'm not saying we we know ev- we don't know everything, but there's a specific reason we do what we do, and here's why. You can choose yep. to agree with it or not, but like, we'll tell you the why behind our story, as opposed to yeah, going to like Costco and buying a cheap set of trekking poles. Um, be- you know, the Costco is selling trekking poles because they're they can make them cheaply. They know they can sell X number of units. They could care less what you do with them. They don't care, <laughs> but they will still sell them to you. Uh, <laughs> so. And nothing well, against Costco. Shout out to Costco. <laughs> love, love me some Costco. But uh, it's a, it's just a different um, it's a different world. 
Yeah, and 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 you know, like the the film the film aspect, like I think that's helped so much with with you guys specifically. Like I said, just from from me, like that's where I found you know you guys was through uh, through films. I I want to say maybe was it I have it pulled up here on my other screen. I want to say it might have been Chasing Ridge Lines. I felt like it was oh, before man, that. that. Been, yeah, seven, like that was like OG. Years. Our first film, Chasing Ridge Lines, or uh, uh, probably like Hunting the Last Wild Places, The Frank. The um, Frank, yeah, that was another yeah. one. Um, but yeah. the Chasing, I mean, I have watched Chasing Ridge Lines, you know, many times, and and you know, me and my cousin before we go out west you know, years ago, we pull that up and watch. Oh, it really? We go out, yeah, well, yeah, like that. Was, oh man, was and <laughs> even like when I started doing films, it was to to me like I wanted to do it in a way that was telling a story and was beneficial versus, you know, right now, a lot of things that, it, that is popular on, on hunting content is like the, the vlog style. And, and, and I don't, I, I'm not saying I don't enjoy that, but for me, I just really connect with those films. And so I was like, okay, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm not a person that I don't make my living off of hunting films or filming my hunts. Thankfully. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like talking to people on the podcast better, but so it's like, okay, I can pick and choose a couple of them a year that I want to do that are meaningful, have us that I feel have a story to tell and do that. But a lot of that inspiration has come from, from people like you and, and uh, you know, others that have paved that way in those film side of it. And I just think it's, I don't know. I just, when, when something you can evoke emotion out of, or you want to watch again, that's to me, I, oh, that's man, I a job well that. done. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, it's funny. Well, it's, I thank you. That's very kind of you to say. It feels like when you make a film, you're really like putting yourself out there. And so, and you, I mean, it's, and YouTube can be savage. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I've had people say all sorts of things about me and it's hard for me to let, like, let that go. Like it's mostly good, but then you get the, get the people out there um, who say some savage things, but uh, chasing ridgelines, we made that. I mean, I was a no, I mean, we didn't have, I didn't work in the hunting industry. We were nobodies. I was a nobody. And not to say I'm somebody now, but back then I knew nobody. I didn't know anybody. I was literally like cold emailing people and hoping that they would respond. And we were just lucky to get, you know, enough of a response uh, for that one film that, and that was it, man. We made that. There was no plan to make more. That was yeah. it. There was no like, we're going to make a film and then a media company. And then there was nothing. It was just like, Jason and I felt a strong calling to make one piece of content that was really focused on not like that, that, that was a story of my brother and I that had nothing to do with like shooting a big animal. It's all about the place and the importance of place to hunting. And then it was like, we're done. And that was it. And we made it. And then it was like, people were interested in more. And so we were like, well, maybe we'll do one more film. Let's just do one more. And then we'll call it quits. Cause I had no interest. I had a job, I had a career. Like this wasn't a, this wasn't a career path for me. Yeah. yeah. And then it became one. That's, that's so cool. And, and it's funny how that, you know, kind of happened by accident, you know, in, in a way, yeah. but like, and also like, I think one of the things that I've connected with and you just said it there was about place and mm -hmm. about that experience versus, you know, and even like for, for me with like on the whitetail side of things, I love hunting big deer, but if I were to want to just, if that was my main goal is to hunt big deer, I would go hunt places that have the biggest deer versus I like going to, to cool places and be able to go in and, and do that. And it's like, to, and that tells so much of a, a story and from a, a viewing standpoint and then just even being in, I enjoy going to new places. Like I'm not going to, um, you know, spotlight where I'm elk hunting this year, but like what the, the, one tag I got was something that I saw one time and that just the area looked like I, like I need to hunt there some yeah, someday. Totally. So totally. put in for a bunch of years until I could get that tag. And it's like, cause I'm like, I'm more excited about going to the place. Yeah. They're the, are there supposed to be big bulls there? Yeah. But the, to me, it was like about that place and being able to, and I think that's one of the reasons I've connected, you know, say the Frank or, or like just those, those wild places to, to, be able to go to and, and be able to experience that. And even like I said, on the whitetail side of things too, 
the, the Appalachian mountains have so much cool adventure that you can find throughout it. And I was just talking to my brother last night. He's like, let's go, you know, let's go to upstate New York and hunt the Adirondacks and, and, you know, just set up a wall tent and, and, you know, go hunt deer just on the mm-hmm. ground with rifles and, and have fun with it. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Like, let's do that. And am I going to, am I going to find a world-class deer there? Most likely not. And that's, that's fine. Like, cause I, I want that experience and being able to, and even to like, I, I've, you know, read books and things of places and just seeing things from the past of like, I want to experience that in the now, for, you know, what people had seen before. And, you know, the, the Frank was one that was a, a interesting film for me because, um, <clears throat> my girlfriend's grandfather who has, has now passed away but before he passed away, he told me about when they would fly into the, the Frank and, and hunt back in the seventies oh, wow. and the eighties yeah. and to be able to like, yeah, back and, and just telling stories about, I'm like, man, that's, that's so cool to, you know, talking about how steep it was in the one, you know, the one day that when they got dropped off and they didn't have their food was supposed to be dropped off on a plane earlier or something. I can't remember how it was, how it happened, but they didn't have food for like two or three days in there. And it was just like hearing those stories. I'm like, so cool. It's so cool. Yeah. And I, I think that that was, you know, a big driver for us originally was the feeling like there was a disconnect between hunting media at the time. There was, there were very few people other than I think Steve and meat eater who really even talked about the importance of place. It, it was really just about the end product, like the killing of the thing. And of course, everybody cares about that. I care about it. You care about it. Mm-hmm. Everybody likes killing big shit. Who does not But that's not always the thing. Right. And just like you just mentioned, like the thing that's always gotten me so excited is like thinking of the place, right? Like where I'm, I can picture, I can close my eyes and picture my favorite places to be, whether it's like a meadow or a mountaintop. Um, and it's different for everybody, but the, that sense of place is something that everybody can relate to. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that. I, f- I feel like there's a much broader recognition of that, why that matters. Um, and in particular for me, like big wild country, like I just like wild ass country always have, always will drop me off somewhere in the middle of nowhere and let me go. And I'll be, (laughs) I'll be happy. Um, because it's just, we live like these just very sheltered lives. Everything is curated in our lives, everything. And, and it's funny that we've got to a point as a society, not funny, but interesting when you look at, when you step back and like the geologic scale that now as a form of recreation, we have to seek out wild places. Whereas before that was just, a part of life that was where you lived, you lived in wild country, but now we have to intentionally create these areas, bar them off from roads and civilization and say, no, 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 no. We're going to set this relic of our past behind, or, or we're going to set this relic of our past aside so we can go sort of experience what it used to be like back in the day. I'm glad we do it because otherwise we wouldn't have it, but it's just, it's interesting that that's where we're at. I also think though, like it doesn't for, for, for me, like even like when I go whitetail hunting in Oklahoma, that's super cool too. I love that place. Like it's, it's different, right? It's, it's a, it's a cattle ranch we hunt, right? So it's not giant wild country, but it's wild in its own way. And being able to appreciate the beauty of each place just for what it is, is really one of the cool things about hunting and anybody who's been, I don't care who you are. If you've been to a big wild ass place, place where you feel like a visitor it will stick with you for the rest of your life you, you cannot avoid that feeling and i don't care if you're hunting or just like you know going on a hike or just whatever driving the car and pulling over on the side of a road like it it will stick with you yeah and yeah i i back when i had started this podcast i had like a a saying that went along with it, like on my logo, it even had it in there. My original logo said, how do you define adventure? And, and for me and what, why, I, you know, how, you know, normally you have a statement in that and that was a question, but it was more so around, you know, I, I once I went out West and I experienced like this very vast wild place that to me, you know, and now I even look at it, it's kind of like, okay, that was more of an over the over crowded over the counter unit but um yeah it was designated wilderness but it was still you know there was yeah, a lot yeah, of people, people there but yeah but that opened my mind to even back home of places that that you can still find that level of adventure in that that place that it is and whether that's you know this this old deer camp that you've been going to for a while and and 
you know, out behind there or some sort of a national forest or state forest or place that you, that you have, and you can go to and you can find that sort of stuff. And, you know, and that opened up to even me not realizing places in Pennsylvania that I was like backpacking into and I could whitetail hunt and spend a week in there and do different things. And it's like, sometimes those wild places don't necessarily have to be this, this thing that you do once in a life because it's, you know, logistically tough, it's financially tough. You can find that in a lot of different places. And that's what's, what's really cool about it. And I think that's more of a mindset shift and looking at ways to, to be able to have that experience in, in different places. Yeah, absolutely, man. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, but yeah, anyways, yeah. So it's funny. It's, I, I appreciate you telling me back to your original comments. That's, appreciate you telling me that, that that film resonated with you because yeah it's hard to know man you put things out there in the world and you're just like i don't know if anybody's gonna watch this or anybody's gonna connect with this <laughs> so well, it's, it's humble yeah and like you said the youtube side of things is such a a dark hole sometimes of like and that's that's one of the reasons why i don't like filming to an extent like the things i don't like about filming is you know for example i was on elcon a few years ago and i messed up and i missed a bowl and then i ended up uh and then ended up skipping one off a branch and hitting it in the back strap and i was just like I was, you know, one, I was mortified at the situation. Then I was like, I've, I made it a point that I was going to show everything that, you know, as it happened, people can learn from it and do that. But I was like, oh man, I'm going to get ripped apart. This might people not play being well. like, yeah. yeah, this like, and, and then that like, you know, kind of sunk in, but really I've learned that, you know, even if someone makes a comment, they forget about it in two minutes and it doesn't really matter. Cause I don't know that person anyways. It's not a, you know, if I feel happy about the stuff that's going out, that's kind of yeah. all that really matters with it. Yeah, that's tough. Like we we tend to just show most things, but there's it's hard because there's uh, it's easy from from a computer screen to judge a situation and say you shoulda, you shoulda, you shouldn't have, and people will do that um, pretty uh, a lot on on the internet. So it's yeah, it's a it's a balancing act between. I think being honest and candid and also not, not, you know, understanding that, uh, not everything is needs to be on the internet that you film. Yeah. 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 Also one thing I feel like that, that I've learned is like that there's different places on the internet where people perceive things differently. Like, say, yeah, that's a good point. like if someone's listening to this podcast and we're sitting here and talking about things, I feel like someone's engaged. They're listening to conversation for an hour plus long of sitting through that. You know, you can explain things. It's a little bit different than a, a 15 second clip that goes on Instagram. Like th- that's, yes someone's just, you know, someone's coming to this podcast to listen to us talk about something versus, uh, you know, something that pops up on someone's Instagram feed or even, you know, YouTube I'm learning is is like, can be like that too. But there's just this, there's, there's different place. I kind of look at it from that side of it too, of like, okay, there's certain things that go in certain places. <laughs> yeah. We had uh, a couple years ago, we did a series called the Brooks brothers. I have two brothers. And so we did a, a film series about my brothers and I hunting together. And my youngest brother shot a deer, wounded it. And we ended up tracking this deer mule deer for full day, came back the next day, spent half the day looking for it. Anyways, never found the deer. Right. That was my brother's like one hunt a year. We had a long conversation about, you know, should he keep hunting? And I told him there's nothing I- illegal about wounding a deer and then continuing to hunt. It's a personal decision. I wouldn't tell people what to do. That's just my personal ethics. I wouldn't tell you, Bo, like, hey, you need to stop hunting because you wounded a deer. Some people say, if I wounded a deer, I'm done. Some people, other people say, I'm going to keep hunting. For For him you know, we're, we survive off wild game. That's what our families eat. So for him, he was like, I feel he was really torn and he decided to keep hunting. And I told him, I said, okay, we're going to show like uh, in the content, we're going to show that you wouldn't this year and we don't find it. People will never understand the length of time, amount of effort that we put in to look for this deer and didn't find it. They're going to say you didn't look hard enough, guarantee it. Even though I know we have exhausted our options and we're not going to find this deer. Um, nobody will understand that. And they're going to criticize you for it. And sure enough, like what happened, right? That's exactly what happened. But 
I also didn't, uh, I never apologized for that. It's like, Hey, listen, that's his personal decision to keep hunting. Um, he ended up not shooting another deer. So it was like kind of an irrelevant point, but Again, it's like, uh, it's, I think it's hard when you edit a film and maybe you show a minute and a half of looking for a deer that doesn't really help you contextualize like a day and a half worth of trying to find any sign and not finding any, right? It's like, it's been a day and a half. Is that enough? Two days, three days? Like how much is enough? Um, and it's really just like a judgment call based on your experience about whether or not you feel like it's a likelihood of you finding this animal or not. So anyways, but yes, on the internet, is that the right, was, was YouTube the right platform for that? Like, I don't know. Um, but I think most people understood the situation. And, um, and I think most people that do understand it aren't going to comment and be like, oh, I understand. They just kind of like, oh yeah, I've been yeah, in that situation. Move on, moving right? on. And, yeah. and that's what, like, I, I think for, I think what, where I've found where I do show those things from when I go to shows and stuff and I have people come up and actually have conversations, it's like, man, yeah. I, you know, I really appreciate that even when you miss or you have a problem or, or you do something stupid that you still show us or tell us about it because, you know, I've, you know, I feel, I, I don't feel alone that, you know, I'm watching someone on, on YouTube and th- they do everything right. And then I'm over here yeah. screwing things up. And so it's relatable from, from that standpoint. But again, there is this, that, that balancing side of, of doing it. And also from a, you know, a, a damaging side to hunting from, from an outside perspective too, is, is something that has been in my mind more so than, than in the past. That, that is honestly a really, I think about that a lot. Like mm-hmm. it's not just because it happened doesn't mean you need to show it on the internet. Cause it's not a good look if you don't understand hunting, like things dying is usually not pretty. Like the way things die, animals die is usually not just like peaceful and quiet. Like it can be real messy sometimes. That doesn't mean you should put it on the internet. Right. <laughs> like So, so for example, yeah. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. So like, I can't remember if we talked about this in our whitetail film, but um, I misranged that buck I shot because uh, I had like ranged little leaves on the ground. I don't know how you do mm-hmm. it, but I just like ranged some leaves that I saw yeah. and had it all in my head. Um, I don't know what a real whitetail hunter does. That's I do the same thing. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> Makes me feel better. Bo. Um, I, I misjudged that deer. I, I think I had it at like, I thought he was at, uh, he was at 25 yards and I thought he was at 30. So I shot him like right above his shoulder, right in the top, like in the bottom of his spine. And he dropped like a sack of shit. Right. And so it wasn't pretty looking. So I had to put another arrow in him, but we chose not to show that we had that on camera, but it didn't look good. It was not a good look. It wasn't that I was embarrassed that I made a mistake. I'm not like, I wouldn't talk about it, but it didn't look good. Um, and I'm like, I don't, I don't want, not that I don't care about what it makes uh, says for me, but it's not a good look for hunting to show that. So we just chose not to show it. Um, so yeah. And, you know, and, and that was, I thought you did that in a, in a tactful way that you did talk about it of, okay. like, as far remember. as what <laughs> you did talk yeah. about that, okay. that happened. Um, but you didn't show the animal, you know, getting right. paralyzed yeah. and, yeah. and hitting yeah. the ground. You're like, Hey, you know, the shot happened and, you know, camera cut and it's like, shows you, I think you climb down the tree and then go, no, I shot it. Finishing shot. Right you shot tree. it out of like, the tree. I, I pulled another arrow, um, real yeah. fast and just put one in there. Yeah. 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 And, and I, and I thought that was a good way of being able to, again, explaining things didn't go exactly the way that you had hoped to, but not having to necessarily show it that I could get pulled and put out of context or anything else too. Yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, that's something I've tried to talk about on here more too, is like with helping people that are, you know, getting into social media or YouTube or anything of, of thinking about it from that way. And, you know, I used to have the attitude, I mean, right after I got out of college, I had this attitude of, you know, I'm never apologizing. This is just, you know, <laughs> right, 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 you know, things right. happen or whatever. And it's like, that was a really shitty way of looking at it because, you know, we are the minority, a minority as far, as far as the population when it comes down to hunting. And it's really important for us to show that in a, in a positive light and be able to explain, you know, even if things don't go, go well, be being able to explain that and, and, and be able to show it because no one wants that to happen. No one, you know, you feel shitty as hell about it. And that's just, Oh man. It, but yeah. it's, it's hard to, it's hard to show all of that on, you know, in a short video. 
It is. I, man, I saw the other day that, that, that like, I'm not going to apologize attitude. Like I can relate to that, Bo. I really can. It's like, let people interpret it how they want. You know, that doesn't help. That doesn't help our cause at all. It really doesn't. Um, I don't think that means we shy away from being who we are, but you just need to be, you need to be thoughtful about it and realize, and, and just a recognition that, that we're, we're sort of allowed to hunt essentially the privilege because of the rest of the country lets us to so far. Right. Um, we're just, we, we don't have the votes, it's just a simple fact, math fact, right. When you look at across the country. So, but man, yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. I saw, I'm not going to name names here, but there was somebody in our industry who posted a pretty savage video of uh, a bear hunt situation. I saw it. Never should have been on the internet. Do you know what I'm talking no. about? Yep. I know exactly which one okay. you're talking about. I was just like, what are you doing? Like, yes, of course that's hunting. Yes, of course that happened. But like, why is this on the internet? This is just like, nobody will, nobody understands this. Nobody will understand this. Um, e- even people I think that I know who probably like are like, yeah, like I know, I know Brad, he likes to hunt. Like I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with hunting. No problem. They don't hunt themselves, but they see something like that. And they're just like, ugh, seems kind of yeah. like grotesque Gross. and like brutal. Um, so anyways, just like stuff like that. Yeah. Um, well, reminds one, one me thing, that, yeah, I, I, I have this thing where, uh, listeners will submit, um, pictures I share every Monday, mountain buck Monday, I call it. So if they have, you know, they pulled something from a tactics from a whitetail standpoint and, and they shot a buck in the mountains or the big woods, you know, I'll share their success photos. Well, nice. you know, just that, that can be difficult sometimes as far as the quality of photos I get in sure. or like, sure, sure. You know, there's tongues hanging out and there's blood everywhere. So, like, I'll spend a lot of time trying to clean up the photos before sure, sure. I'll share them. Or, you know, there's only been one time where I've had to, you know, email the person back and be like, I'm really sorry about it. Unless you have other photos, like, I just don't feel good about sharing the, yeah. the photos yeah. of, of this just because of, you know, and to me, it's like, I would see that photo, you know, and hanging up in a camp or anything, I wouldn't think anything of it, but it's just the, the, again, trying to, to put that out in, in a way that, that doesn't, doesn't look terrible to someone from the outside or someone that's not, not anti hunters by any means, but people that are kind of in the middle or don't have a, uh, you know, a, a dog in the fight about it. Yeah. Which is the vast majority of people. They don't have a dog in the fight. They're just like, yeah, whatever. Like you do your thing. I'll do mine. But, um, they're not inherently anti hunting. Um, those are the people we need on our side, right? (laughs) People that, that are fine with it. They're, they're just like, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm good with it. Um, let's not give them a reason to, uh, you know, take up, uh, the other side of the, of the, of the battle cry against us. So yeah. Anyways, I, I don't, I don't mean to get off on a tangent there, but I no, just like, no, that's no, I'm glad. I'm glad that you brought it up. I don't think that can be talked about enough. So I think that's, that's, that's important. But, um, on, on a more important note, what do you got going on this year? Do you got any, uh, any good hunts planned? Well, you know, uh, I've never been one to say no to a good time. So, uh, yeah, I've got a, I've got a lot of good things going I'm uh, Let's see. I'm, I'm going next week. Uh, I'm going to go bow hunt axis deer in Hawaii going on a, a sheep hunt in Alaska in August. Um, got a couple elk hunts in September, a couple mule deer hunts and then a whitetail hunt and then, uh, going to Mexico later this year. Dang. So, That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I try to, I try to make sure there's enough time to have fun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> things kind of stacked up this year. This year was just like, I drew, uh, I drew a tag an elk tag that I did not expect to draw. Like I shouldn't have drawn my points, but I drew, uh, kind of just got lucky on one elk tag. So, um, I'll, I, I'm like, well, I wasn't planning on that, but of course I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. so yeah, but yeah, a lot of fun stuff here planned. Um, Hawaii is a good warm up. Hawaii is just like a great warm up for, the hunting season because it's a target rich environment. Um, and so you just get a lot of practice, like spot stock practice and a really condensed amount of time. So yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah. I really want to do that hunt sometime. That's just access deer in general, Texas or Hawaii. They're just, Hawaii would be cool. Cause it's just like, it's, you're in Hawaii, you're in this, this yeah. beautiful place and being able to do that. But I've also heard they're super difficult to, to spot and stock as far as like, 
being kind of skittish animals and everything like yeah. i think that i think that'll be pretty cool definitely give you'll me be some dialed practice. in man yeah you'll be dialed yeah. in if you do it uh mouflon i think mouflon sheep are the hardest thing hardest spot sock animal i've ever hunted i hunted those on lanai last year and i thought coos deer were the hardest animal to spot stock but i, I think mouflon take the cake they are tuned in um, really very very tuned in they and, and axis are hard too but but not, they're nothing like Mouflon. Mouflon like have eyes in the back of their heads. They're crazy, 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 yeah. crazy tuned in. Um, so yeah, I'll, well, anyways, after this weekend, I can get you, I can get you dialed in on, on setting you up with something, something in Hawaii. You could have a good time down there. Yeah, man. I'd love, I'd love to be able to do that. And, and, and I'll, I'll say it on here publicly, but we, we need to do, we talked about it at the show, but we need to do a whitetail hunt out west um Dude, an you, adventure you, style white tail you hunt. tell me when you're ready anytime i've got yeah. places to go and uh yeah you come out to idaho we can do a hunt um I, I would have that would be really fun man uh, i would love to yeah. do that actually um i'll start thinking about like hunts we could do how's that yeah, I'm I'm serious about it. Like I I, oh, yeah. I definitely want to I would want to do that. I, I don't I don't remember if you brought it up or something when we were at Western Hunt and I was like, "Oh yes." And then I texted you about it afterwards. I was like, <laughs> "Man, this year's pretty full, but like let's let's actually plan this out and 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 do it. That'd be a I blast. think next year's realistic. Yeah, like this year's yeah. like yeah, like you and I are the same. Like my my dance card gets filled up pretty early, but so this year's not not realistic, but next year for sure and Anybody, I know we don't know each other super well, but anybody who knows me knows like if I tell you I'm going to do something, like I'm I'm in, I'm committed. So yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so if you're if you're really interested in it, um, I will start. Uh, I'll start poking around and we'll find something to do. Yeah, no, I'm 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 definitely interested. I've talked about it enough of but never committed of like wanting to to go do the natural like western whitetail hunt and is to the point where it's just like, usually I talk about something enough. And then once I finally commit, then it's, it's all in. Let's do it. So <laughs> it's all in. Okay. All right. Good to know. I will, uh, let me, let me start doing some homework and let's kind of uh, pencil something in for next year. Yeah, let's do it. Well, Brad, I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking with me and, and sharing everything with everybody. So I, man, I just, I really appreciate that we were able to, to get together and do this. Yeah, man. It's, uh, like I said, uh, fan of the platform, fan of the podcast. So it's nice to, uh, nice to be a guest on the podcast and, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you having me on, man. It's been a fun conversation. Yeah. And where can, where can everyone find, uh, some stuff about you, Argali and, and everything you're going on there? Um, our website, argaliaoutdoors.com, social media, Argali official, YouTube, Argali at Argali, uh, and then, yeah, I have personal stuff too, but that's boring. It's just like family dad shots. Nobody wants that. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. And, and like I said, check out those films, um, there that we were talking about on the YouTube channel. It's definitely worth the watch there to, to be able to do so. Yeah, man. Cool. Awesome. All right, Bo. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thanks buddy. Hey guys. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, share it with your buddies. Leave us a rating, a review, and subscribe. If you want to check out more content like this, there's plenty in the links below. We truly appreciate having you guys along with us.